Can you imagine a world where you move seamlessly from one place to another, never stopping to turn on a light, open a door, or plug in or fill something? That's the world of automation. It's not about laziness or luxury, it's about being human. It's about using our ability to adapt, to empower ourselves to focus on what's most important. It's about freeing our minds to create and innovate. It's about not worrying about the little things so we can build the big things. How do you get this more comfortable, more carefree, more fruitful life? You might find a little help from Smarter Circuits. Welcome to Smarter Circuits. I'm your host, Ian Klein. We've been trying to find ways of making difficult or repetitive tasks easier since we've been able to do difficult or repetitive tasks. Automation isn't new. But what is automation? The most common definition you'll find is doing something without human intervention. An extended definition might be getting the laws of nature to do your work for you, and we've been at that for a very long time. Starting with the various means of counting time from marking it on a stick to measuring flowing water, using gears and springs, and eventually using electricity, we slowly figured out how to use nature to remove human intervention. The result is that we automated the measurement of time and were rewarded with precision as we got better at it. I want to give you some ideas on how to break down the things that silently rob you of your time. Instead of just giving you specific devices, I want to familiarize you with some components you can use to tailor your solutions to your specific needs. Then, I want to challenge you to combine these components in ways you wouldn't normally think of. This is not going to be the only video I do on this subject. It's really an introduction to a recurring series on components. There are simply too many components to cover in one video, so I'll do a few per video like this every so often to keep giving you fresh ideas. As an example, this is a float valve. It has a very simple and reliable function. The float here stays on the surface of the water, and as the level lowers, this arm opens a valve and lets more water in. When the water level rises, it slowly turns the valve back off. I realize this isn't a circuit, but it is automation. It fills the container without any need for human intervention by using a few natural laws in creative ways. At some point during that explanation, you probably thought, well, yeah, that's what fills the toilet tank back up after you flush. But I want you to focus on the thing this does, not what it's already used for. Let's say you wanted to make an automatic watering dish for a pet. This device allows you to use a regular water line to top off your pet's water. Although, having an American Bulldog, I can tell you there's no easy answer for the slobber rinsing issue indoors. Outdoors, though, there is one thing you can do. This is a solenoid valve, normally closed. That means that when you apply voltage to the coil, it opens the gate valve in the body, allowing water to flow through it. Otherwise, it stays closed and you get no water. If you used both of these devices on a water line to supply water to a large container for your pet, you could cycle the solenoid valve occasionally to overflow the dish to remove the top layer of goop. I'm not suggesting you do this, although I have used a float valve for an outdoor watering spot for animals. I'm just illustrating that normally you might not consider using these two things together in this way. Another combination of these could be used to fill a coffee pot reservoir. You don't want the reservoir to fill while the coffee is brewing because it'll just keep brewing the water it has inside while it's on. So you can shut the water off while you know the pot is on with this valve. You'd probably want to wait until the internal heating elements cooled before introducing cooler water as well. Now, let's consider this solenoid valve in the normally open configuration. Let's say you had one of these on your main water supply line to remotely shut off the supply while you do maintenance. You would only want to use the power to hold the valve state for a short time, otherwise the valve will be open anyway. In that scenario though, there's a better device, a motorized ball valve, which is just a DC motor you can run either way to turn the otherwise normal ball valve on or off. The valve has no spring return, so it just stays like any other supply line valve will after it's been turned by the motor. The point is, look at the most basic function of each component without assuming its only uses are the most common. They are, of course, the most common for a reason, but if we didn't look at new uses for things, we'd never have most of the technology we have today. When you're automating, you start with a condition in which you want something to happen, then you try to devise a method to do the thing. Let's start with how you can figure out some of those conditions, then we'll move to how you might do some of those things. This is a wire. Nothing fancy, just a solid core copper wire. This is another wire. Again, simple copper wire. When I bend this one like this and place it over this one, I've created a momentary switch. Bear with me, I'm going somewhere with this third grade science TV host stuff. The thing I want you to take away from this is that I have to exert a specific amount of force on the wire and move it a specific distance 
to make contact with the other wire. It's a limit switch. I could have just shown you this, but then you might have thought it was more complicated than the earlier example, and I really want you to remember what is inside this switch, and that's a spring and two wires. There's a neat little snap device that makes sure the contacts close and open quickly, but I'm not talking about that right now. You can find these in two orientations like the valves, normally closed or normally open, in this case meaning off until it's pressed or on until it's pressed. But remember what I said was important to know about the two wire example? There's a specific distance this travels, and that's the obvious use. Machines use these to stop moving parts from going too far or to know when a certain part is at a certain location. But watch this. I can also use this as a weight trigger by establishing how much force it takes to depress and then designing a lever at the appropriate length to calibrate it to my desired target. Tractors often make use of this technique. If you've ever ridden a heavy riding mower or tractor, you'll know that underneath the seat, there's a dead man switch that kills the engine if you fall off. That works the same way this works. If you want to know how much weight you're dealing with so you can display it or do something different at different weight levels, well, that's where this sensor comes into play. This is a load sensor that measures how much deflection there is in this calibrated aluminum block. This gives you a way to calculate how much force is being put on the block. And there it is. The first thing most people would think of is a scale, but what about the automatic throttle of some kind of equipment like a lawnmower? You could move nearly any heavy thing this way. In fact, there are already commercial and industrial machines that do this exact thing. The more you push, the more the motor helps. Stop pushing and the motor stops. The first component I talked about in this video was a float valve, which is a self-contained input and output with its own static logic. The second was a solenoid valve, which is an output. Then I covered the limit switch and load sensor, both of which are inputs. I want to leave you with one more output to make it even. This is an infrared laser. You can see a faint red dot in person because it's a cheap one, and the camera I'm using has a less than adequate infrared filter to deal with it, so you can see the purplish dot here, but that's not really important. The reason I prefaced this as an output device isn't just because it emits a semi-visible dot or that the camera can sort of pick it up, although you should think about that last one on your own a little. The reason I want to talk about this as an output device is because you can use it to send data further than your Wi-Fi might reach as long as you have line of sight. In the next video in this Automation Components series, I will show you how to use this cheap infrared beam receiver and this cheap infrared laser to send sensor data and more from a distance. I will continue to do the explore and create back-to-back -back videos, but I will be adding in series videos like this one and another I'm planning for showing more step-by-step -step builds. I may add some recurring title prefix to make it easier to categorize them. I've been trying to put them all in playlists, but I'm not sure which thing or if both would be better. Let me know in the comments if you have any thoughts on this. I considered using another channel, but then I thought about it for a while, and I came to the conclusion that the very word channel denoted a themed collection of different styles of shows or videos, so I think keeping everything I do here on Smarter Circuits is the best path. If I see less interest in some videos, I'll simply make less of those. If I see more interest, I'll try to make more of that. Easy. Ish. Again, if you have any thoughts on this, let me know in the comments. I have a lot of ideas, that means some of them are bound to be bad. If you like what I've done here, let me know by liking the video. I don't like pushing people to do that, but maybe it slipped your mind. I don't know. If you did like it and haven't already hit the button, please hit the button. Thanks for listening to me ramble, and I do hope you'll join me for future videos as I continue exploring Smarter Circuits.